As 1916 came to a close, it became obvious that the U.S. would soon be drawn into the conflict in Europe. With that in mind, the War Department began a top-to-bottom review of the entire military infrastructure. They looked at everything, equipment, armament, and personnel. One deficiency they discovered was that the nation didn't have a combat helmet. Now, originally, that wasn't any big deal. In fact, helmets were almost perceived as novelty items. That perception began to change, however, when medical reports from the British and French clearly showed horrendous casualties were being caused in the trenches due to airburst artillery, shrapnel, and hand grenades. This is the story of America's development and adoption of a combat helmet. In 1917, the U.S. General Staff formed a committee to evaluate British, French, and even German helmets to assist in the design of a true American helmet. Prior to official involvement in the war, American volunteers were assisting the French Army in the Ambulance Corps. They were issued the first modern combat helmet, the Adrian, designed by French General Augusta Adrian and equipped with a distinctive American badge. General Adrian's helmet was the first helmet used by Americans in World War I. When the U.S. finally entered the conflict, those Americans serving in the Ambulance Corps were absorbed into the American military. The Adrian was a relatively thin steel helmet with a leather suspension and a leather chin strap. The helmet was evaluated for use by U.S. forces. The U.S. also evaluated the British combat helmet which was used by the Canadians, Australians and other Commonwealth countries. The British combat helmet, designed by John L. Brody, was constructed of a much stronger steel and could take more punishment than the French Adrian. However, the helmet wasn't perfect and it provided coverage only to about one-third of a soldier's head. With both the French and the British jockeying for the American military to adopt their helmet, what truly tipped the balance was a British offer to provide 400,000 helmets to the Americans immediately. The offer was accepted and the new helmet was designated the M1917. The adoption of the helmet was considered a stopgap measure until the Army could develop its own helmet, but in the meantime, the Army went to work seeking production bids from steel manufacturers to produce the helmet. From the moment the U.S. entered World War I in 1917, the U.S. military truly wanted a unique and distinctive American combat helmet. Many experimental and prototype designs were created, but they were all rejected for a myriad of reasons. In the 1930s, some of these experimental patterns resurfaced, but once again they were turned down. One idea that had persisted from the 1920s, however, was that of a two-part helmet, a liner system that would fit inside of a steel helmet shell. In 1940, Secretary of War Patterson made the decision not to order additional M1917A1s. This cleared the way for the development and the design of the most famous of all American helmets, the M1. In August 1940, after two decades of foot-dragging and indecision, Assistant Secretary of War Robert Patterson finally put his foot down and refused to sign an order for additional M1917A1 helmets. Patterson realized the World War I design was obsolete and ordered the Army's Infantry Test Board to design a new helmet. The assignment for the new helmet fell to Major Harold Sydenham, who worked in the Infantry Board's test section, formerly known as the Department of Experiments. Stationed at Fort Benning with his wife Zelma and young child, Sydenham was known as an innovator for his support of a two-part combat helmet. The M1917A1 and M1917 helmets provided sufficient cover to the crown of a soldier's head, but left far too much of the back of the head and sides exposed. Sydenham reviewed Bashford Dean's experimental helmets and determined that the crown of an M1917 style helmet, coupled with the side and rear protection of an experimental 5A, could be the answer. Under the direction of Sydenham, apparently an M1917 and an experimental Model 5A were taken to a metal shop on Fort Benning. The helmet shells were dissected and the appropriate parts were welded together as you can clearly see in this rare example and then pounded into shape. The design was designated the TS-1 for Test Section Experimental Model 1. As experimentation continued, two other test helmets were constructed. The TS-2, which had a rivet in the crown to hold the suspension in place, and the TS-3. The TS-3 design can be identified by a rivet which holds the chin strap in place. Both the TS-2 and TS-3 were very similar to the TS-1. In 
In the spring of 1941, the final modifications to the experimental TS series of helmets was completed. This consisted of welding chin strap loops to the inside of the shell and then sewing a chin strap onto the loop. Like the M1917 of World War I, the new helmet was ballistically tested and it passed. The new helmet was approved on June 9, 1941 and was designated the M1 helmet. Sydenham's mission, however, was only half done. He now had to develop an appropriate suspension system for the new M1 helmet. From day one, the Army had insisted on a two-part helmet with an independent suspension inside the liner. The helmet liners that eventually became standard and preferred by the military were produced using a high-pressure method. By this time, specifications were being distributed to liner makers. Companies with household names such as Westinghouse, Firestone, and Inland produced some of the finest high-pressure liners. These liners were made from a resin-soaked duck cloth that was positioned in a mold and then hydraulically pressed into the correct shape with a force of 150 tons. This resulted in a hard, smooth surface such as this unpainted example. The M1 helmet proved its value. Post-war estimates indicate that some 35,000 American soldiers would have been killed were it not for its protective qualities. The helmet was worn by every branch of service, from trainee privates to high-ranking general officers. From its lineage back to Riddell's football helmet suspension to its experimental TS-3 days, the M1 helmet held up to the challenges of combat and set the standard for combat helmets of its day. Harold G. Sydenham's M1 helmet would continue to endure and protect American and Allied soldiers for decades to come.